Good morning. I'm Jeff Hammond with IGSPA. Thank you so much for joining us for our first Dig Deeper webinar of 2023. We appreciate sponsorship by Climate Master and uh, feel free to check out the IGSPA website if you'd like to sponsor one of these Dig Deeper or Town Hall uh, webinars. So with that, I'll get started with some news on the latest uh, updates for IGSPA, and then we'll turn it over to our uh, presenter this morning, Lance McNevin of PPI. So we are we do have quite a few town hall and dig deeper uh, scheduled on the calendar. If you go to igspa.org and click on events and training, you'll see that list of of uh, speakers that we have already arranged. But we do have quite a few openings available. So if uh, if you're interested in speaking at a town hall or a dig deeper, the town hall webinars are a little bit more uh, broader topics, and the dig deeper are a little bit more technical. Just go to uh, the IGSPA website and submit an abstract. We'll be happy to take a look at that. We'd, we'd love to have uh, new topics for sure. I mentioned uh, Climate Master's sponsorship of the webinar today. If you're interested in sponsorship, go to that same location, igspa.org, click on, on events and training, and you will find a uh, link to the sponsorship page. Just to save the date note here, we're partnering again with NGWA for our annual conference in December. We'll be back in Las Vegas again this year. It's December 5th through the 7th. We have a lot of details coming up in February, so stay tuned. Watch for emails and uh, social media posts on all the information for our 2023 annual conference. Also, uh, new, new information here on the business directory. If you haven't seen the latest version, it's now an interactive map. And so you just click on the state or province and you'll get a list of everybody in your uh, local area. There's also some really nice search features if you want to search by geographical areas served, by company name, by sector, by what have you. Uh, it's easy to find uh, business members on, on the directory. And once you pick a, a particular member, then you'll pull that up and you'll see all the information, links to their website, contact information, and a little bit about that, com that company. So it's a great way to recognize your organization and make sure that members can find um, all the various uh, IGSPA members who might, might be needed for a particular job coming up or just for some expertise. Uh, new news, uh, if you didn't see this in the uh, newsletter that went out this week, IGSPA is hiring. Uh, we're looking for an administrative person. It is full-time. It's a remote location. We'd like to find someone in Illinois or one of the connecting states. And also, this is a good time to point out, we have a job board. Go to igspa.org and uh, click on job board listings. If you'd like CEUs for this town hall, or for, excuse me, for this Dig Deeper or for town halls, simply send a chat message. Please include your email address and your name, and we'll keep track of those for you for the town hall and Dig Deeper webinars. Just some housekeeping. If you would, please send your questions in the chat. At the end of uh, Lance McNevin's presentation, I'll be reading the chat questions, and then he can address those. That makes it uh, you know a little bit uh, easier to uh, navigate. Please mute your microphone unless you're speaking, and we will be recording this webinar for viewing later on. Uh, just check out the IGSPA website at the top. You'll see a YouTube icon. Click on that, and uh, usually it takes a day or two to get that uploaded to the website, and you'll be able to watch this recording. All right, and finally, uh, our disclaimer and potential conflict of interest. The upcoming presentation represents the opinion of the presenter and does not represent any official position, opinion, or endorsement of any products or services by IGSPA or its members. IGSPA town halls and dig deeper webinars are for member updates and education on the latest information in the geothermal heat pump industry and are not meant to endorse one technology or brand over another. It's the presenter's responsibility to disclose any conflict of interest or position that may arise in, in the content of the webinar. With that, let me introduce our speaker, Lance McNevin, and we'll let him take over after, after the introduction. So feel free to uh, go ahead and, and switch screens, Lance, whenever it's convenient for you. 
Lance is the Director of Engineering for the Building and Construction Division at the Plastics Pipe Institute, or PPI. He has been in the plastic pipe industry since 1993. Whoops, excuse me, just lost my uh, uh, bio. Involved with applications such as hydronic heating and cooling, geothermal plumbing, and fire protection systems. Lance, during, Lance earned his IGSPA accreditation in 2008 and has been closely involved with the geothermal industry ever since with the focus on piping materials used for ground loops, including codes and standards. He serves on technical committees within ASHRAE, ASPE, ASTM, AWWA, CSA, IATMO, ICC, IGSPA, and RPA. So we're excited to turn this over to Lance McNevin. Thank you so much for agreeing to present today, Lance, and uh, we'll let you take it over. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much, Jeff. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. All right, we've got the tech figured out and that's a big win. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for hosting me. Uh, very great to be uh, here as part of this uh, Dig Deeper webinar today. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. We've got 74 people on, that's awesome. Um, this presentation today, it's uh, almost identical to a presentation I gave during the IGSPA conference back in December in Las Vegas. If you were at the conference, you realized it was an, an, an incredible conference. It was amazing and uh, there was so much content there were, I mean, when I was giving this presentation, there was other presentations that I wanted to see. Um, and I know uh, IGSPA has made all the content, the slides available, uh, and you can download them if you are a conference uh, attendee or registrant, you can download the content, content, but there's nothing like actually hearing the presenter actually present uh, the content. So, so for anybody who missed the presentation in December, um, that's probably why you're here today and I, uh, I appreciate that. So let's see if I can get this to move forward. There we go. Um, Jeff did the introduction for me already, but here's kind of uh, all that uh, stuff written on the screen in words, the big list of acronyms for different technical committees. So uh, my day job is I'm the director of engineering for PPI's building and construction division. So I'm a full-time employee of PPI um, and as a staff engineer, my job is to coordinate research, publications, education, advocacy, and industry outreach uh, that we do within my division of, of PPI and that's the building and construction division. And uh, I realized the other day, yeah, I've been active in the piping industry since 1993, which all of a sudden that's 30 years ago. So I think that makes me officially old uh, to have been working in this piping industry for 30 years now. So anyway, hopefully I know what I'm talking about for these topics here today. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, the Plastics Pipe Institute is a nonprofit trade association, just like IGSPA, or a nonprofit that was formed to serve our members uh, PPI started way back in 1950 um, with a group of engineers in the plastic pipe business that wanted to get together and determine test methods and how do we standardize dimensions and fusion systems and things like that. Uh, so this was 73 years ago now that the Plastics Pipe Institute was first formed. Um, today's, today, the PPI office, uh, the headquarters is down in Irving, Texas. I was just down there earlier this week. Um, and we have five divisions that focus on the same kind of goals for all our members. Uh, for different types of pipes for different applications. And as I mentioned, I work for the building and construction division. And this one really could be known as the plumbing and mechanical division because we focus on pressure pipes used in plumbing and mechanical systems. And of course, ground, ground source geothermal piping systems are a big part of that. The materials that we represent within this division of PPI are shown here in alphabetical order. So we have CPVC, high density polyethylene, PEX, PERT, PEX aluminum PEX and polypropylene, uh, of which there's two types there. So we're gonna be talking about these materials today. Um, so if you go to the PPI website and you're trying to find information on geothermal or these materials, first you have to go to the building and construction division and that's where you'll find it. Or just click the link that's shown right there, which will take you there directly. Um, and PPI and our division of PPI, we've had a strong belief and affiliation with geothermal piping for many, many years uh, and huge respect for IGSPA and all the work that Jeff and the board of directors at IGSPA are doing and Sally, um, hard work rebuilding the association, but making it better than ever. Uh, and the timing couldn't be more perfect as everybody knows. Uh, right now when the, when the world and the industry really needs a great trade association, IGSPA is here. Um, and actually last summer, PPI and HBA signed a memorandum of understanding, otherwise known as an MOU, uh, to talk about all the ways that our two organizations are gonna collaborate. Um, so, I mean, our job at PPI, we're the pipe guys. 
but uh, wherever possible, we're going to try to provide the geothermal industry with piping knowledge, piping information, um, solutions that uh, that are needed. So, uh, so that's our role in this industry. So, getting into today's topic, which is on inside or indoor piping materials and new alternatives, uh, and that refers to piping materials that maybe you haven't seen used for uh, inside or indoor piping before. That's what our focus is going to be here today. Um, the ground loop pipe. Everybody here knows what the ground loop pipe is, and we have these three uh, drawings from HBR that kind of uh, illustrate that for us. But when we talk about inside or indoor piping, we're referring to headers or manifolds that could be inside vaults or buildings. Um, the piping that connects the ground loops to the heat pumps and the piping used to distribute hydronic energy throughout a building. All of those kind of applications could be thought of as the inside or indoor piping. And different organizations use different terms. Some people call it interior piping, some people call it inside, some people call it indoor. Uh, so to me, all three of those words mean the same thing. It's the piping that is inside or indoors. Here is one example of what uh, we talk about with inside or indoor piping. Um, in this case, it's very simply the flexible connectors between the heat pump and a, and a flow center, and then the pipes that go from the flow center beyond there. So you could think of that as inside or indoor piping. Here's another big example here on the wall of a big commercial building on the right-hand side with some polypropylene that's being built uh, up to create probably a primary secondary piping connection system. And then these images on the left refer to some big manifold systems that could be um, installed indoors. Uh, we have a few more images here. In a lot of cases for big commercial systems, we're using outdoor vaults uh, to kind of decentralize our piping and help consolidate it in big chambers. Uh, before we have major trunk lines going inside the building. But the manifolds, the headers, the piping that's inside those vaults or chambers, that's essentially, that's also uh, inside indoor piping uh, because it's kind of inside a, inside a space and not buried directly inside the ground. So that's the type of piping that we're talking about here today with this terminology. And then here's the presentation outline. Uh, there's three parts to this presentation. Um, part one, we're going to talk about industry standard and code requirements for inside indoor piping materials focused on geothermal. And number two, then we're going to talk about the recommended types of piping materials for inside indoor piping and geothermal systems. And that's PPI's recommendation as to which materials um, are, are suitable for these applications. And then the third part of the presentation is we're going to touch on some PPI resources for sizing and designing inside indoor piping or even the outdoor ground loops as well. Um, so it's just three parts of the presentation, but there's still a lot of content. So I'm gonna keep moving pretty quickly here. So the first part of this is on the geothermal code requirements for inside indoor piping. So that's the first thing we're gonna do is look at codes and see what do the codes allow us to use um, for this type of application. And there's four major mechanical codes in North America that relate to geothermal that we're going to look at. The first of these is ANSI CSA HPSC 448, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about before from previous presentations that Jeff has done. Jeff is the chair of C448, so uh, very involved with that. And then we're going to take a look at the 2021 editions of the ICC International Mechanical Code and IATMO's Uniform Mechanical Code, and another code from IATMO called the Uniform Solar Hydronics and Geothermal Code. And all of these 2021 codes are uh, available uh, at any time. So we'll start with CSA C448 because that's probably my favorite. Um, and that's really the only one that's really dedicated to geothermal systems uh, and also covers the design of geothermal systems. And if you're familiar with this document, it's broken up into several parts. You can think of them as sections or chapters, um, but they go by sub digits. So in the beginning, we have C448.0. And there's actually a definition here. The definition uh, says building loop or indoor piping is the piping that connects the heat pump equipment in the building to the ground heat exchanger after the transition between the ground heat exchanger piping or ground heat exchanger manifold inside the building. So that's one definition for what indoor piping refers to. But of course, it could be assumed to be more broader than that as well. Um, but that's our starting point. And again, here's a few more pictures to kind of illustrate what are we talking about with this piping. In this case here, this was a PEX geothermal project. That's why the pipe is gray. And the pipes are coming in through a wall with little tiny link seals uh, sealing the concrete wall penetrations. 
and then polypropylene manifolds are mounted inside the wall of this vault. Um, so in that case, that's all indoor piping. The manifolds is indoor piping, and then the black polyethylene pipe to the left of the manifolds is indoor piping, taking the fluid uh, to and from those manifolds, which essentially is connecting directly to the ground loops. So that's one example. Here is some other indoor piping. In this case, this is a gray version of polypropylene pipe that is making all the interior piping. Um, and then here's a very large commercial picture here with some really large high density polyethylene headers uh, connected to many, many different um, uh, legs going out through the walls and out into various ground loops. So this could be a system with hundreds and hundreds of boreholes uh, out, out in the fields. There's some more words in C448 related to indoor piping, and that's the term that this document uses is indoor piping. Um, under the general section, it says pipe, piping, fittings, and pipe accessories connected to the ground source heat pump system shall be appropriate for the intended use and shall be in, uh, installed in accordance with the relevant safety and fire specifications with good industry practice. So it doesn't tell you what uh, exactly which ones to pick in this section, but later on in C448, it does give you some recommendations. But it does put some burden on the installer or the selector, whoever is choosing these pipes, to make sure that they are appropriate for the intended use. Um, and this uh, comment here about fire specifications, we'll talk more about that in a few seconds, uh, a few slides from now. So that is one source of information to look at. And then also in the same document, if you go to the C448.1 section, which is on commercial and institutional buildings, uh, it says that design and selection of the indoor piping distribution system should consider operating temperature, operating pressure, pipe expansion contraction, hangar requirements, water chemistry, and the workforce capability of installation personnel. So that's a good guidance right there to be able to say, okay, you know, uh, here's the types of piping materials and here's the, the things this piping material needs to be able to withstand and resist the temperature, the pressure. Uh, it can't have ex excessive expansion contraction. Um, it has to have reasonable hanger requirements and the installer has to be able to uh, work with those to make sure the pipe is not hanging or drooping and things like that. And it has to be compatible with the water chemistry or the fluid chemistry. So that's good information here. Uh, and then it does actually give you a section kind of prescriptively. It says the indoor piping shall be comp comprised of polyethylene or PEX, steel piping systems, copper piping systems, fiberglass reinforced polypropylene um, or PVC piping material in special cases. So there is a section there that does allow C uh, PVC in very special cases. Um, so there's a lot of cautions to watch out about if you're thinking of using PVC pipe. Uh, and this is what the exact language says under special cases. I mean, PVC, it's a rigid material, um, comes in short pieces. It has to be joined via solvent uh, cement uh, joining. Um, but the thing to be most concerned is, uh, is right here in letter D, where it says there is potential pipe degradation due to the refrigerant oil interaction with the pipe polymers. And a lot of us have heard stories from Kerry Proffer and others of situations where people have used PVC pipe for their interior piping, and it did not end well. Uh, the pipe didn't last. Uh, the pipe, the joints, the fittings were attacked by um, oil you know, interaction in the fluid. Uh, they really just kind of damaged the pipe and broke it down over time. So uh, you have to be very careful when using a material like that for interior piping. So that's the content of C448. Now let's take a look at the other codes. Uh, the International Mechanical Code, the latest version of this is 2021. And it does include some information about ground source loop pipes. And that's in chapter 12, table 1210.4 includes this table right here called the ground source loop pipe table. And uh, I don't know who wrote this. Uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> this has been in here for a while. And these are the pipe materials that are allowed according to the International Mechanical Code for the ground loop pipes. Um, we don't agree with this. And in fact, for the next edition of this code, we may be actually making some changes to this or, or, or trying to make some changes to this uh, potentially. Um, and in fact, when I say the next edition, what I really mean is the 2027 edition, because the 2024 edition of this code is already finished and completed and will probably be available later this year. So anybody who wants to change anything about the International Mechanical Code, uh, the soonest opportunity for those changes to take effect would be in the 2027 edition. Codes are on three-year cycles, US codes, and they're very long cycles. 
Um, but anyway, the International Mechanical Code doesn't really mention anything about inside or interior piping. So that's all we got in that code. Um, in chapter 12 that we were just looking at, uh, it provides a list of approved hydronic pipe materials. So for hydronics, that's all the distribution pipe inside the building, whether it's hot water or chilled water, uh, which could be coming from geothermal or any kind of heating and cooling source. So lots of piping materials are allowed there, uh, but it's not necessarily just uh, the, the piping that we think of connecting the ground loops to the, to the heat pump or something like that. So that's all we get from the IMC. Um, so not the best guidance that we need here. And then we can look at the IATMO Uniform Mechanical Code, the 2021 version of that. Uh, Appendix F is all about geothermal energy systems in the Uniform Mechanical Code. Um, but it's mostly focused on the ground loop piping, uh, just like with the International Code. So in Table F 104.2, there is a table that talks about the four approved piping materials for ground loop piping. And those are PEX, HDPE, polypropylene, and PERT. And in this case, the polypropylene, it's not a flexible pipe, so it's really not intended as the ground loops itself, but it's widely used for the headers, which could be outdoors. Um, and that's, uh, that's in this uh, Appendix F. And then if you go uh, look up for information about indoor piping, which is the second little box that popped up here, it says, go to chapter 12 to look for information on indoor piping. And chapter 12 of this code is all about hydronics. Uh, and it again, it has a huge table with a list of approved materials for hydronic piping systems. And I'll blow that up a little bit so we can see it a bit better, uh, but it's not specific to geothermal. So again, in this code, we're not really getting any specific advice about what type of indoor piping is recommended or, or, or permitted for, uh, for the interior piping of geothermal systems. Just kind of loops it all in with, uh, with hydronics. The other IATMO code um, that actually has geothermal in its title is this one called the USHGC, uh, the 2024 version of this one still in development. But it, it is laid out and arranged very similar to the Uniform Mechanical Code uh, in the sense that there is a chapter, chapter seven, all about geothermal systems. And that's what's showing here now on the side. Uh, and it includes a table 703.2, very similar to the other Uniform Mechanical Code with approved ground loop piping materials. And then for the indoor piping, it tells you to go to chapter four which is all about hydronics. Um, so if we go to chapter four for hydronics, again, we find a table that is all about materials for hydronic and solar thermal system pipe tubing and fittings. Uh, but again, this is a wide range of materials, not specific just to geothermal systems, but that's the type of content we get from, uh, from this code. Um, so those codes necessarily don't give you the best guidance. Uh, so that's why um, I guess you're here today, which is great. Other thing I uh, said we have to talk about in this section of the presentation has to do with flame and smoke spread ratings. And this was referred to in the CSA code, the C448, uh, when it talked about fire resistance and things like that. Um, it is a requirement in all the codes and the Building Code of Canada that if any piping or any kind of combustible material is to be installed within a return air plenum that requires non-combustible materials, then the pipe must demonstrate a flame spread rating less than or equal to 25, and a smoke spread rating less than or equal to 50 when tested in accordance with one of these two test methods, ASDM E84 or UL723. Uh, and to come up with those numbers, what this means is manufacturers who make plastic pipe in this case actually submit their piping in 20 foot lengths to let's say uh, underwriters laboratories, for example, or Intertech testing in Canada, and they put their 20 foot lengths of pipe inside a big tunnel known as the Steiner Tunnel, uh, which was developed almost hundred years ago. And they apply flame to one end of the pipe and set it on fire. And basically they measure how quickly does the fire propagate down the length of the pipe, how quick, quickly does it burn? And then they also use windows and electric eyes and sensors to measure how quickly is smoke coming off that pipe and filling up the chamber with smoke, which would block people's vision in a building. Um, so for any system where you plan to be putting pipe inside a return air plenum in a building, um, you have to make sure that the pipe is tested and certified accordance to, uh, in, accord in accordance with one of these two standards in the UMC world, if you're in a place that's uh, controlled by the Uniform Mechanical Code. 
if you're in a jurisdiction that follows the International Mechanical Code, uh, the requirements there are similar, but a little bit different. It also allows the same kind of test results from ASTM E84 or UL723, but it also allows testing in accordance with a different UL test method called 2846, which is specifically written for plastic water pipes. Um, and the requirements are shown here. So the requirements in UL2846 are very similar to those in E84, but they're described differently. Uh, and that's the exact language that is in the uh, International Mechanical Code for, for that type of flame and smoke spread requirements. And then in Canada, the flame and smoke spread testing has to be in accordance with CAN ULC S102.2 is the test, test method for Canada. So if you are doing indoor testing or indoor piping, um, and it's going inside any type of return air plan and make sure that you have uh, sought this information. And each manufacturer has to do this testing um, and carry their own certifications. So if I'm buying plastic pipe from manufacturer XYZ, I have to ask them, hey, give me your certificate for this pipe to show that the flame and smoke spread ratings are, appro are appropriate for the code that is in effect in wherever it is I'm working right now whether it's UMC territory or IMC territory or the National Building Code of Canada. So each manufacturer does this testing on their own. Um, so for example, uh, what I showed on the screen there was some PEX tubing from Upanor, uh, one of the PEX tubing manufacturers. And then if you go to their website, you can actually find their list of certifications of exactly which pipes are allowed to be used in a return air plenum. And if I back up a little bit here, one of the important things is for a lot of plastic pipes, uh, the way they achieve this flame and smoke spread testing is actually with insulation on the outside of the pipe. Now, fiberglass insulation, you would probably be putting that on indoor piping anyway to reduce heat transfer through the pipe, whether it's heated pipe or chilled water piping. Um, and that same type of fiberglass insulation is typically tested with these plastic pipe materials uh, and is uh, part of their certification for flame and smoke spread testing. So. Um, on the UPNR website, you even find a list of insulation materials that have been tested and approved for use with their pipes. So you specifically have to use the right insulation on the right type of pipe to be able to fulfill these requirements for the code. So that was a lot of detail on flame and smoke. I hope I didn't go too deeply into that, but um, I just thought that was an important thing for everybody to be aware of. So that wraps up, <coughs> excuse me, that wraps up the first part of the presentation which is on those four codes right there. Um, and now we're gonna move on to the second part of the presentation, which is our recommended piping materials for inside piping. And uh, again, if you look at the CSAC 448, there is a list of recommended piping materials. Uh, you could use copper, you can use steel, and then some other materials are inside as well. Uh, and in fact, there's actually five plastic pipe materials that I'm gonna be focusing on from CPVC to HDPE, uh, which means high density polyethylene, PEX, PERT, and the two types of polypropylene materials. Those are the ones that our organization recommends for use for inside indoor piping. So that's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, and before we get into some very specific details, just some general information about uh, pipe that everybody should be aware of. If you're not, here you go. Um, there is a difference between tubing and pipe. In general, we use the word piping to talk about all those you know, tubular containment systems that hold liquid inside. Um, but if you're being very specific, if an engineer says use two inch diameter tubing in one part or somewhere else, he says you inch, use two inch diameter tubing uh, versus two inch diameter pipe, um, those are actually two different materials. It's Well, it's the same material, but it's two different products. Uh, and tubing means that the actual outside diameter is an eighth of an inch larger than the nominal size. That's how copper tubing was developed many, many years ago and plastic tubing follows the same sizing scheme. So plastic tubing has the same outside diameter as copper tubing of the same nominal size. When we talk about pipe, uh, then it means the actual outside diameter matches that of iron or steel pipe of the same nominal size. So a two inch plastic pipe has the same outside diameter as a two inch steel pipe. Um, but then there's also metric pipes where if they talk about a 63 millimeter pipe or a DN63 pipe, that means the outside diameter is little, literally 63 millimeters. So the polypropylene pipe materials um, are produced according to uh, metric dimensions such as that. 
So tubing can be known as NTS, which means nominal tubing size, or also known as CTS, which means copper tube size. And then pipe is officially known as NPS. So if you wanted to ask for some three quarter pipe, uh, it's officially known as NPS three quarter, which means national pipe size three quarter. And notice there's no actual inch as part of the official designation, it's just NTS three quarter or NPS three quarter, um, which is also known as iron pipe size. And then this graphic down below here kind of shows the difference. So uh, in the geothermal uh, world for ground loops, we're typically using IPS size pipes because they're bigger than CTS size pipes of the same, uh, same nominal size. So in this comparison here, we have a one inch CTS tube on the left and a one inch IPS pipe on the right, which is about 15% larger in the diameter. And therefore you have a 15% larger um, inside diameter as well for the fluid. In the plastic pipe world, we often talk about dimension ratios a lot. And a dimension ratio is specifically the ratio of the outside diameter to the wall thickness, calculated by dividing the average outside diameter of the tubing or pipe by the minimum wall thickness for that uh, dimension of the pipe. Um, this graphic in the upper right here, on the left-hand side, we have uh, a piece of SDR64 vent pipe next door to a piece of SDR11 pressure pipe. Um, and what the 64 means is that the wall thickness is 1 64th of the outside diameter. We don't use that in geothermal. Um, for the image on the right, what the 11 means is, is that the wall thickness is 1 11th of the outside diameter. So the way dimension ratios work, the smaller the number, the thicker the wall. Um, and the reason that we use dimension ratios or standard dimension ratios in the plastic pipe business is so that every size or diameter of the same wall type or the same SDR will have the same strength and the same pressure rating. So in other words, an SDR polyethylene pipe in two inch has the same pressure rating as an SDR four inch pipe of the same material. Um, so it's to keep that consistency in the dimension ratio. When we talk about PEX tubing, a little later on, PEX tubing is all SDR9, which means the wall thickness is one ninth of the outside diameter. It's very strong, it has a nice thick wall, um, but in some cases, some people consider that to be too small an inside diameter. When we look at HDPE pipe, you can also get that in SDR9, but more commonly it's used in thinner wall uh, versions like SDR11 or SDR13.5 or SDR17. So that's just kind of some terminology to clarify. Okay, now let's get into our specific piping materials. Uh, and the first of these is CPVC. CPVC, so we are recommending CPVC for indoor piping, interior piping in some cases. Um, CPVC is not the same as PVC. It is actually a greatly upgraded version of PVC that has been chlorinated via a free radical chlorination reaction. That's what the chemical engineers tell me. I'm not a chemical engineer. Um, but basically CPVC material has an extra chlorine molecule added to a PVC molecule. So that extra C is actually an extra chlorine molecule added to PVC. Uh, and it actually provides a lot of improved properties as compared with PVC. It's a more expensive material, but it's also a stronger material and has much greater taper, uh, temperature capabilities. So it can withstand much higher temperatures with regards to the fluid inside and has better uh, chemical resistance in most cases as well. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But keep in mind that CPVC is a distinct material from PVC, it is not the same. So here's kind of a summary page about CPVC uh, pressure pipe. It's a high temperature pressure pipe system rated for continuous operation up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit not likely you would need that in a geothermal system, but a lot of hydronic distribution systems go that high if you're using radiators or something, uh, and CPVC can handle that. It's been around since 1959. The material was first developed by B.F. Goodrich um, for plumbing pipe materials, and the first system was actually installed in 1959. So that's more than 60 years ago now. So it's not new, it's been around for a very long time. And as we saw, it is approved in the codes for all kinds of um, hydronic heating and cooling applications. And it is suitable for that. It, it comes in rigid lengths, uh, typically 10 foot long pipe lengths. It could be 20 foot long lengths. And it's available in both the copper tube size dimensions and the iron pipe size dimensions. 
And there's a big list of ASTM and CSA standards that I'm going to show for all these piping materials um, that these pipes are produced in accordance with. So the configurations, like I said, is provided in straight lengths. Uh, so it's self-supporting. You don't need a huge amount of brackets or fasteners, although you do have to design it properly with enough brackets and fasteners if the pipe is hanging on the wall. Um, the carpet tube size diameters are available up in diameter two inch or CTS two to be accurate. And then the iron pipe sizes are available all the way up to 24 inch or IPS 24. And the fittings for CPVC are gonna be molded from the same material as the pipe. Uh, so it really creates kind of a continuous system in that sense. So it's the same pipe and the same um, fitting material. And there's four different ways of joining CPVC, believe it or not. Um, the most common of those is solvent cement. You can also use push fit fittings or grooved mechanical fittings like those from Victaulic or even flanged connections with CPVC. But the most common way of joining CPVC is with solvent cement. And one thing to clarify here is that solvent cement is not glue. Um, glues work by providing a sticky layer between two components to create a bond. So we've all worked with glue from childhood up to being a carpenter or anything else you're doing. We know what glue is. Uh, it's an adhesive that holds two things together. But solvent cement is different because solvent cement, um, as this second graphic here shows, actually basically dissolves two solid surfaces uh, inside the solvent liquid that you're brushing onto them and then allows the molecules from the two different surfaces to flow into each other. And then when the solvent evaporates uh, and the joint is um, dried up, then it really becomes a monolithic component where there's no seam between the pipe and the fitting. It's really just a, you know, a continuous piece of, of CPVC material. So most of the CPVC is joined with pipe inside a socket fitting. So you've got a really thick uh, total wall thickness at that joint because of the thickness of the fitting over the outside of the pipe. Um, and it's really a monolithic structure at that point. There's all kinds of rules and regulations and procedures you have to follow to do it right. You can certainly make bad solid cement joints that will not last, but if you follow the processes and do it right, uh, it is extremely strong. Uh, but the one thing to really pay special attention to about CPVC is chemical compatibility. And I can't get into all the details of that right now, but there are, different job site chemicals um, or different job site uh, products, sometimes even some sealants and caulking and materials like this, which can be not compatible with CPVC and can weaken the material and cause early failure. So the best way to know if the products you're using on the job site are compatible with the pipe, um, the vast majority of CPVC pipe in North America, uh, the material is made by a company called Lubrizol in Ohio and they've done extensive testing about the chemical compatibility of their products, and they share all this information on their website. So if you go to the link uh, as shown here, what you're looking for is the Lubrizol uh, FBC system compatible program. And then you can simply search for any type of chemical that might be coming in contact with a pipe and find, about, find out if it's compatible or not. And they even have an app. So you can even go to the app store on your mobile device and download the FBC system compatible app. And whether it's a paint or a sealant or a caulking product or a fire stopping uh, material, uh, you can check and see if it's compatible with the pipe. And if it's not, then don't use it. Or maybe that isn't the right pipe material for you and maybe you should use something else. Uh, but to wrap it up, CPVC, it's a strong rigid material with high temperature capabilities available in a wide range of diameters and different wall types. Uh, depending on the pressure rating that you need, you can get it all the way up to schedule 80 wall type, which is going to have, you know, burst pressure ratings over 1000 PSI, uh, if that's needed. Uh, and there's a wide variety of fitting shapes and sizes available. And for sure, it's uh, going to be a lot more economical than, than copper. So that kind of wraps up CPVC. Now let's move on to our next material, high density polyethylene, which is everybody here is super familiar with that as our uh, uh, most common ground loop piping material for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it also can be used for indoor piping, as I'm sure you're familiar with. It's a strong and tough material, has very good ductility, it can withstand impacts, it can withstand, you know, things falling on it and things like that. Um, it is suitable for applications up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit at kind of its upper, uh, upper limit of temperature exposure, but in most geothermal systems, we're not getting anywhere close to there uh, either. Um, it does have good chemical resistance. 
uh, in general, I mean, if you think of most of the nasty chemicals you buy at the home store, they're coming in a polyethylene bottle, whether it's a gas can or uh, something for killing weeds or all kinds of other chemical things, the vast majority of them are coming in a polyethylene bottle. So polyethylene inherently has very good chemical resistance. And when it comes to HDPE pipe, uh, there's a variety of different ASDM standards and a CSA standard that controls the dimensions and properties of, uh, of those pipes. Um, to provide a little detail about the codes for polyethylene, because we get a lot of questions about that, because there's lots of different polyethylene products out there. My, my, my garbage bag is made of polyethylene, but that's not a pipe grade material. Um, so for pipe grade materials, they all have a code which describes their performance. And some codes you've probably heard a lot of over the years are shown at the top here. PE3408, PE3608, and PE4710. Um, and those are known as thermoplastic pipe material designation codes. And the actual uh, meaning of those numbers is defined in an ASTM standard. ASTM is the American Society of Testing and Materials, which has been around for 125 years now. This is their big birthday. Um, ASTM F412 uh, provides the definition of what those digits mean. And the first digit, uh, like the three or the four, refers to the cell classification number value for density. So a four means it's a higher density material than a three in this case. The second digit refers to the cell classification number value for slow crack growth resistance. That's a very important property for polyethylene. Um, and we don't have a lot of details on that in this presentation, but one of the uh, greatest susceptibilities of old polyethylene, the 3408 type, was that when the pipe was in the ground buried, if there was a rock rub rubbing against the pipe, uh, making a scratch or a gouge, that crack could grow over time and eventually there would be a crack in the pipe wall. Um, the old version of PE3408, it was good, but not great when it comes to slow crack growth resistance. The new versions of PE material, especially PE4710, are much, much better. Um, so they get a seven instead of a four or a six in terms of slow crack growth resistance. And then the third and fourth digits refer to the hydrostatic design stress when tested with water. Uh, in units of 100 PSI. So I won't get into all the details of that now, uh, but I'll show you how to find out more details later. But PE4710, which is by far the most widely used polyethylene material on the market for both ground loop piping and indoor piping today, uh, most of the manufacturers have switched over to that material grade. It has higher density than the old 3408, which means higher stiffness and also higher strength, much higher slow crack growth resistance, higher hydrostatic design stress, it uses a higher design factor and therefore you get higher pressure ratings. So it's a far superior material. When it comes to joining HDPE, um, typically heat fusion is the way that we join HDPE. And there's three different types of heat fusion joints used with HDPE. And each of those joints are controlled by different ASTM standards. So this is a lot of information on this slide here, but uh, the first type of heat fusion joining is butt fusion where according to a certain process, uh, two pipe surfaces can be heated and pushed against each other with a certain amount of force to allow the two material surfaces to fuse together. Uh, that's very well proven. Socket fitting joints are using a similar process, process, but you heat the outside of the pipe in the inside of the fitting and then push them together with some force and then the materials weld themselves to each other. And then there's electrofusion fittings um, where there's copper wires embedded inside the fitting. You put the pipe inside the fitting, connect the fitting to an electronic machine, which applies a current to the wires inside the fitting. And basically the fitting welds itself to the outside surface of the pipe. Um, each of those fittings has an ASTM standard to describe the, the, the fitting or the joint. Um, and then there's different procedures that installers are supposed to follow as well for doing types, types of fusion. On this slide here, there's a really colorful image on the left. Basically what this is, is many years ago, a polyethylene pipe manufacturer made some samples of pipe uh, with all different layers of colored polyethylene. So they got polyethylene of all these different colors, red, you know, rainbow colors, yellow, blue, green, whatever, extruded to this pipe and then followed the heat, uh, the butt fusion process to join two polyethylene pipes, butted up against each other to be able to show how the material flows in a butt fusion process. 
And then they obviously took a picture of it and that's the image on the left here. Um, so butt fusion really does allow the material to flow a lot. And some of that material flows into the bead on the outside of the pipe or the inside of the pipe. Um, a lot of the history about butt fusion of polyethylene is found in a PPI document known as TR33. But to get really good advice about how to do polyethylene fusion joints, you need to get your access to an ASTM standard. What I said there was you need to get access to an ASTM standard known as F2620. And this has been updated a lot over the years, but F2620 actually provides you with the procedure for proper uh, polyethylene fusion procedures. Uh, you can't you can't get it for free. You do have to buy it, but um, from the ASTM organization. But we definitely recommend that you purchase that if you're doing any kind of fusion at all for both indoor or outdoor piping. So I, I need to move along here quickly. Um, that's our summary of our HDPE pipe, a very familiar material. The next piping material I'm going to uh, represent here is cross-link polyethylene, and I'm sure everybody is familiar with this now. It's a very common pipe used in radiant heating applications and plumbing applications. It's also used in water service line and other applications across North America. Um, PEX is HDPE that is cross-linked during its manufacturing process. So it actually becomes a, uh, an enhanced version of HDPE with some superior properties to HDPE. So think of PEX as kind of like a supercharged version of HDPE that can withstand much higher temperatures, uh, has even better slow crack growth resistance and other benefits as well. And PEX is not a new material. In fact, PEX was first commercially sold in Europe for radiant heating systems in 1972. So that is now more than 50 years ago. Um, the PEX has been used in commercial applications around the world. PEX was first approved for geothermal ground loops in North America in 2008 by IGSPA. Um, and it's approved in all the codes as we saw for the different types of indoor piping as well. Uh, and it's used in a wide range of applications. Um, the density of PEX is slightly less than HDPE, uh, and by having a lower density, that's good in the sense that it makes it more flexible. It's easier to uncoil and things like that, but with a lower density, it also has a lower tensile strength and therefore a lower pressure rating for the same wall thickness as compared with HDPE. Uh, but otherwise, it's a strong and tough material, and it's pressure rated for applications up to 180 degrees. And for most manufacturers, their pipes are rated for operation up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit if you needed that type of um, uh, capability. Uh, in North America so far, all the PEX is produced as a tubing dimension. Uh, so it's not IPS size, it's CTS size. And there's lots of different fitting and joining options available, uh, but not butt fusion or socket fusion. That type of heat fusion, fusion does not work with PEX. So the common types of PEX that we can get today are PEX 1206 or PEX 3306, for example. Those are the tubing material designation codes for PEX. And according to CSA C448, uh, the grade known as PEX 1206 is the minimum grade of PEX that's allowed for geothermal, uh, geothermal ground loop systems. Now, I said a second ago that PEX cannot be joined with butt fusion or socket fusion joints. And that's because uh, essentially in PEX, uh, all the molecules are cross-linked to each other. So if they're cross-linked to each other, then they can't flow into a fitting. They, they can't, the materials, the molecules themselves can't flow from one component to the other. Um, so most of the PEX fittings on the market work on the principle of compression, meaning there's something that goes inside the fitting, um, sorry, inside the tubing itself. And then there's something that compresses the tubing over the, the part of the fitting that's inside the tubing. Uh, so here's just kind of group picture of different fittings available from different manufacturers. Uh, and here's a common example one here, copper crimpering fitting. Uh, believe it or not, these have been around for more than 25 years in North America, and they actually work extremely well. The insert fitting itself could be brass or it could be plastic, and there's basically a copper ring that is deformed and compressed over the outside of the tubing, compressing the tubing over the ribs on the fitting on the inside. And they actually work extremely well. And those can be done with hand tools or electric tools. Uh, one company uses stainless steel press sleeves, which is a lot like a crimp ring fitting, except instead of a copper crimp ring, it's a stainless steel sleeve on the outside. And they use either electric tools or uh, hand tools to do that. And another common fitting system is known as the cold expansion fitting system. That's the image on the right here, where you expand both the tubing with a ring of pecs on the outside of it. 
Um, another fitting system used in geothermal is called the cold expansion compression sleeve fitting system. That's the image on the left here, which has a fitting that goes inside the tubing. And then a brass sleeve is pulled over the tubing, compressing it over the ribs of the fitting. And then finally, um, you can do electrofusion fitting uh, fittings with some types of PECs. It's up to each manufacturer to do that testing and get that certification uh, to show that their tubing is compatible with electrofusion fittings. And some of them are, um, but not all. So you really have to ask the manufacturer if their uh, tubing is compatible with uh, electrofusion fittings. So to kind of summarize up PEX, um, and then we just have a, two more materials to talk about, and then we're almost done here today. Uh, PEX is a tough, durable, flexible, strong material, high temperature capabilities. It's very suitable for the indoor, indoor piping. It comes on coils, so you can use long coil lengths, which helps to avoid a lot of fittings. It is flexible. Uh, you have to use hangers more often than if you were using a rigid pipe material like copper or steel or CPVC. But in a lot of cases, you gain in continuous lengths of pipe. Um, that's a huge advantage compared to the disadvantage of having to use maybe more hangers or brackets. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely an option uh, for interior piping. There's another, <coughs> excuse me, newer material that's available in North America now called polyethylene of raised temperature. And I really just have one slide on this because PERT, uh, it's been in, in use in Europe since the 1980s, but it's newer to North America. It is HDPE, um, but a special version of HDPE that can actually withstand higher temperatures. Um, and as it says here, it's suitable for temperatures all the way up to 180 degrees. Again, if you need that type of temperature, it has the same dimensions as PEX tubing. So it's available as a tubing product. And it works with all the same PEX fittings that we looked at a minute ago that work on the principle of compression, but it also can be joined via heat fusion because it is a polyethylene material that is not cross-linked. So the summary of, H, uh, of PERT is it's an HDPE material with higher temperature capabilities, and it's almost a hybrid between HDPE and PEX. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that right now, but it's less expensive than PEX, more expensive than polyethylene, um, but it, uh, it installs and works just like polyethylene. Um, and it gives you those same fitting options that you have with polyethylene or the same fitting options that you have with PEX. So that's why you could kind of think of it as a hybrid material. Now, finally, the fifth material we're gonna talk about, which is widely used for interior piping and manifolds is known as polypropylene. And polypropylene is a family of materials. The two pipe grades of polypropylene are known as PPR and PPRCT. And those materials have been used uh, in Europe since the 1980s, which is now more than 40 years ago. Um, and they were introduced uh, to North America in the last 20 years. All these polypropylene pipe materials today, uh, most of them are still produced in, uh, in Europe and imported here, but some of them are produced in the United States, so they can be produced domestically. Um, but they're all being produced in accordance with metric dimensions. So uh, if you're getting polypropylene, it's gonna be labeled and marked as a 25 millimeter or 50 or 75. So the soft metric conversion is just divide those numbers by, um, well, there's 25 millimeters in an inch. So a 25 millimeter pipe is approximately one inch diameter pipe. Different manufacturers use different colors. Uh, some use blue, some use white, some use gray, green. Um, so this is just kind of a collection pictures here on the screen. And the two different types, PPR is the original type of polypropylene pipe grade material that's been used for a long, long time. And then the PPRCT, it's a higher grade of PPR material. It actually has higher tensile strength and therefore a higher pressure rating. Um, I can't comment on the price comparison between the two, but the PPRCT, it's actually an improved version of, of PPR uh, because of those reasons. Uh, and different companies make uh, different versions of these materials. In terms of how it is joined, both PPR and PPRCT are compatible with each other. Or they come in the same dimensions. Um, and most of the joining is done via heat fusion. And that could be butt fusion or socket fusion or electrofusion, the three procedures that we talked about earlier with polyethylene. Uh, so it's the same basic procedure as joining polyethylene, but of course the fittings are made out of the, out of the polypropylene material. Um, and then uh, you can also get electrofusion joints with polypropylene as well. Uh, again, these uh, fittings have the copper wire embedded inside the fitting. So when you connect the fitting to a machine, which sends a current through the wire, 
you're essentially melting the fitting. Uh, the fitting melts itself onto the outside surface of the pipe. So that is another approved method of, of joining um, polypropylene pipe. So to wrap up polypropylene, uh, and I went through this pretty quickly, but is, this is a strong rigid pipe material with high temperature capabilities. And these pipes are rated for operation all the way up to 176 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. Uh, a lot of these products have a fiber core reinforcement layer in the middle third of the pipe. And that is there uh, to reduce longitudinal thermal expansion and contraction um, to be closer to copper or steel pipe. Uh, and, and less thermal expansion and, and contraction than polyethylene pipe. It's available in a wide range of diameters and a wide range of wall thicknesses or DR values, depending on what pressure rating you need. Uh, and as you saw, there's uh, lots of different fittings available, elbows, T's, uh, 45s, uh, adapters to metal and everything else. So that is the summary of our five different piping materials that we wanted to talk about. And Jeff, I think I probably have about two minutes left here. Um, so really quickly, I'm just gonna give a glimpse into some resources that our organization offers for the polypropylene pipe industry. And everything that PPI has that we're gonna talk about is free for everybody. We don't sell anything at PPI. Um, all our operations are supported by our members through their member dues. So uh, please just help yourself going to the, uh, the website. We actually do have a webpage specifically all about geothermal ground loop piping. Um, like I said before, we're big fans of geothermal systems, so we want to make it as easy as possible for people to find information about it. So that webpage looks like that. And uh, on that webpage, we have links to some really interesting information about geothermal uh, systems in general, not just our own publications, but other people's publications as well. So it's kind of a good one-stop webpage to go to to get some cool links to other resources. We also have a web page at PPI specifically for each piping material. So we have a web page all about polyethylene that has the information I talked about today, plus more, because uh, you can take your time reading it. We have a web page all about PEX, all about PERT, and all about polypropylene. And in the bottom of each one of these web pages, we actually list the PPI member companies that make that pipe material. So if you go to the, uh, the polypropylene uh, pipe material web page, you would find the list of the manufacturers you, you can contact to, uh, to purchase polypropylene pipe in the bottom of that page. We have a lot of technical documents. If you just go to a web page called Technical Literature, uh, you can download lots of stuff there. And one of the most relevant things we have for geothermal is this document here called PPI TN55, which looks like it's actually five years old now. Um, but it actually is meant to be kind of a guide to polyethylene pipe materials. Sorry, to geothermal pipe materials. Um, and this, uh, these slides here just include a few images of the types of, types of information you'd find inside that document. When it comes to chemical compatibility, if you're curious about what materials are compatible with other materials or chemicals on the job site, there's a great document we have on our website called TR19, first published in 1973. The latest update was in 2020. Um, so when you go to PPI TR19, you basically can scroll through uh, this list of 600 chemicals down the left-hand side and then match it up with the different piping material you're looking at uh, to see if that pipe is compatible with the chemical you're looking for. Um, so I think this document is about 80 pages long, but obviously you download it as a PDF and you can just search for chemicals. And then the final thing I'll show is our plastic pipe design calculator, which was first launched in 2015, but just had a new function added to it recently. You can use this calculator for pressure loss calculations uh, for all different types of fluids that you use in geothermal. You can use it for calculating pipe weight and volume. So if I'm using 160 feet of a certain diameter pipe and I wanna have 50% propylene glycol, I can use this calculator to tell me, okay, how much glycol is it gonna take to give me 50% glycol in that diameter pipe? So that's uh, quick and easy to use. Um, <coughs> it has a thermal expansion contraction calculator based on temperature changes, the starting point, the ending point. Um, it'll do expansion arm and loop design. For interior piping, this is actually really important because you have to be able to accommodate for thermal expansion contraction for the indoor piping. It's not restrained if it's not buried in the ground. Um, so you have to account for that. So this tool on the calculator will allow you to design an appropriate expansion arm or expansion loop. And then the newest function is a static water column pressure calculator. 
So if you're talking about piping indoors uh, in a building, if it's a tall building, you have to think about how much pressure is put into the pipe uh, based on the weight of the water um, caused by the elevation, the vertical water column. Uh, so in this uh, types of a calculation here, you can just talk about how tall the building is, what type of fluid, the average fluid temperature, and that pulls up the density within the calculator. Um, and then it'll tell you what the actual pressure is gonna be at the lowest point in that system. And then you have to check and basically make sure is my piping material capable of withstanding that type of static water column of pressure. Um, so that's it. I think uh, I might've run two minutes late. I apologize for that. But hopefully those resources uh, look to be interesting to people. And the calculator is just plasticpipecalculator.com. It's free to use. Great. You don't have to download it. You don't have to identify yourself or anything like that. So please help great yourself. So, thank you so much, Lance. That was great information. I'm sure uh, since this presentation is recorded, there will be many people who go back and, and watch this again. I certainly will. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of information. We don't have time for questions today since we're, um, we're out of time for the webinar, but I have kept track of the questions that came in in the chat. And I'll go ahead and send those to you, Lance, if you don't mind maybe uh, responding and we'll make sure that uh, that we post those to the to the people who who asked the questions and uh, thanks again for everybody to joining us today it will be recorded just go to igspa.org and look for the youtube icon at the top of the page much appreciated lance and um hope everyone has a nice weekend thank you so much thank you jeff thank you take care